sort of think that religious people are the chief victims of religion and, and um, so I, it's, I, I'm not attacking them at all. So I'm here with Richard Dawkins who really needs no introduction at all. He's the author of course of The Selfish Gene which is voted the Royal Society's most inspiring book, science book of all time and also of The Blind Watchmaker and of course The God Delusion. You've written another book about God. Yes, the uh, outgrowing God, um, which is um, sort of for young people, um, and young people up to the age of about 99 as well. So the book covers a lot of ground that you've covered in some of your other works. I'm thinking particularly The God Delusion, but also there's a, the second half of the book is about evolution. Yes. And the evidence for. Uh, why what, did you feel that young people up to the age of 99 needed yet more Richard Dawkins material on those two topics? I've always felt rather passionate about breaking the cycle of generations as each generation passes on its superstitions to the next one, while at the same time being very keen not to indoctrinate, because that's what, of course, we criticise the religious people for doing. I want to encourage people to think for themselves. If you actually ask people why they believe in the particular religion that they do, it's almost always because that's how they were brought up. So in my experience of children of that age, I have two teenage, teenage sons, they are already really rather uninterested in religion and I don't think need persuading of the reality of something like evolution. You, do you see it Yes, well, I'm, I'm glad to, to hear that. Uh, that cannot be true all over the world, however, uh, certainly not true in America, um, where unfortunately um, religion has a real hold and um, anti-evolution has a real hold. You spend a lot of time kind of picking factual holes in religion and sort of pointing out logical inconsistencies and the absurdities of many of the stories that are in particularly the Bible. And you know, it's all good sport and I enjoy reading it, but is, it, is this not just a bit of a futile exercise? So many people do have a, a, a literalistic Bible-based fundamentalist faith. And so they're actually quite shocked to to, 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 to learn how little support there is for any Bible stories. So many people in America are not aware um, that, for example, virtually nothing in the Old Testament has any evidential support at all. There's no evidence that there ever was a Jewish captivity in Egypt, for example, which is, which is shocking to some people. Even though these things are evidently true, what you're saying is that to point them out, maybe somewhat... It's not futile to people who, be who, who, who believe. I mean, there are people who think that Matthew, that, that Matthew wrote the book of Matthew, Mark wrote the book of Mark, etc. The people who believe that they were eyewitness accounts. It's important to disabuse people of this, that the, the evidence for anything in, in the Bible is extremely flimsy. But I think people believe in God and biblical stories not because of the factual content of the stories, but because of a commitment to a group identity. Very probably, yes, but a lot of people don't. A lot of people literally believe what they read in the Bible. If we can just return to the God delusion briefly. Yes. Um, you spent a lot of time in that book talking about and documenting the harms and the abuses done in the name of religion around the world and there's not so much material about that in the, in the new book and I just wonder what you th whether you think in that respect the world has become a better or a worse place. No, it's become a worse place hasn't it? Um, I, it hadn't occurred to me actually that that had been the change from the two books. Um, interesting you should point that out. Looking at what's going on in the world with things like the restriction on abortion in the US, looking at ISIS, at Hindu nationalism in, in India, you see a, a deterioration of the situation. Yes, I do. I, I, I think and hope that it is um, temporary. Uh, I, I mean, I think in, in any overall trend, there clearly is a trend in the right direction as you look over centuries, certainly, and decades. Um, but you, any trend like that is subject to reversals, and I think we're in a reversal at the moment. So a brief reaction against progress that you think will... I hope will, so, yes. Will... I, I hope it's brief. The downward trend is, 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 is not a trend. I, th I think it's a blip. Um, if you look at the number of people who um, profess a religion in America and in the rest of the world, but it's notable in America, is going down. So that's, that's going in the right direction. And they're actually the, the number of people who say they have no religion is now re really substantial. It's about 25%, which is huge. I mean, it's, it's bigger than most other religious denominations. So that's a very good, uh, good sign. Um, it's not entirely clear whether that, that has given over to rationalism or whether instead it's given over to, it, to um, a, a, a more vague kind of 
nonsensical sort of new ageism. I don't, I, I'm not sure about that. That would be a pessimistic view. Unfortunately, I think you're probably right. I think there's quite a lot of evidence that people, as they discard theologically correct views, they adopt other superstitious yes. views to, re yes. to replace them. That, that could be true. So, in a way, that's why I, I think the second half of Outgrowing God, the, the, the science part, is, is so important. I think we need to really push science, the beauty of science, not just because it's true, but because it's beautiful. Uh, and that as, a, as an enemy against, as an, as, an, as an armory against not just religion, but superstition generally. You don't spend a lot of time talking about the culture war in evolution. Well, it's still going on and um, there are constant little fracas going on. There's an, an anti-science culture in parts of America and evolution is kind of on the front line. One of the targets um, in a previous books has been the intelligent design movement. They, they, they barely merit to mention in your um, new book. Yes, well, you don't have to mention the people behind so-called intelligent design to simply put the positive case for evolution, um, which, which, which I've done. Um, so I want to um, persuade my readers that, that this is an elegant, beautiful idea. Um, which explains all the facts and, and um, um, that, as it were, automatically undercuts intelligent design. We don't have to mention them. I mean, we, we, we do live in troubled times. We do, yes. And I, I, I am interested in your views on, on why that might be. So if you can just explain. Well, on I'm the not idea. a sociologist, I'm not a psychologist. I, I would only be able to give an amateur opinion as a citizen which is <laughs> no more interest than anybody else's opinion. I mean, I think you're right, we live in troubled times and I'm as troubled as the next person. Um, I don't have an answer to why we happen to be living in troubled times just at the moment. I previously asked you whether you th sort of despair a little bit of the world that we live in at the moment. And one of the things that frequently gets blamed for the situation that we find ourselves in is social media. Yes. Now you're a prolific tweeter. I think, yeah, I think that's right. I think, I think that is a point. Um, Ricky Gervais makes rather a good point, which, when he says that um, um, the things people write on the walls of public lavatories, um, you just ignore them. And that's what always used to happen. But now, instead of writing in public lavatories, they, tw they tweet about it. And so that, that's the way to, to treat many of the um, contributions to Twitter. These are people who otherwise wouldn't have a voice. No editor would publish what they write. They, they wouldn't get a letter published in a newspaper. No publisher would publish their, what, they, what, what, what they write. So, so in the old days, all, what they would do is, is write on walls. Now, that, now they tweet. And so um, uh, that's, that, that I, I subscribe to Ricky Gervais's view on that. Have you ever considered quitting Twitter? Because all it ever seems to do is whatever you say, it seems to polarise opinion and inflame. It does. I mean, if you look at, the, at, re, at replies, that, that's, that's what you get. But then if you look at the number of people who retweet, the number of people who, who what do you call it, like, um, um, that can be very, very substantial. I mean, you have been called Islamophobic. And, but I, think I know I have. I mean, I, I, what I've said is that Muslims are the biggest, um, cul not culprit, um, casualties of Islam. I mean, they're the ones who suffer most from, from Islam. So I'm, I'm, I'm anti-Islam, but I'm definitely not anti-Muslim. People have criticised you for maybe subjecting um, Islam to special criticism. You're a critic of all religion, but Islam seems to get more of it. Not at all. I mean, if you look at the God delusion or indeed outgrowing God, Islam is scarcely mentioned. So, I, I mean, I, I, I could more fairly be accused actually of, of attacking Christianity. And, and, and not attacking Islam enough. And you've described the word is Islamophobia as, as otios. I wonder if you could explain what you mean by that. Unnecessary uh, um, and um, actually pernicious because it gives, a, it gives an entirely wrong impression. There's no, there's no word Christianophobe. Or, but we shouldn't be phobic about people anyway. We should be mistrustful of mm -hmm. ideologies where, where they are have pernicious effects, which religion, or I think virtually all religions do. Another chapter tackles moral progress. Yes. And you present a very upbeat picture. Do you worry that this, this, the progress that has clearly happened, do you worry that that's now gone into reverse? No, because I think it's important to take the long view. There's absolutely no doubt that we're getting better as the centuries go by. The, the moral standards of a 21st century person are significantly different from those of a 20th century person. 
for all that we have reversals in the form of people like Trump, we have at the same time a very strong movement in favour of gay rights, in favour of all sorts of other things which would have been inconceivable. I mean, during my lifetime you could go to prison for, for homosexual activities in private. You write very movingly about things like racism and slavery and how they were just accepted as being normal, yeah. in fact almost being a natural state of affairs. If you were to project a hundred years into the future from now, what do you think our current behaviours that we consider to be normal uh, and natural? It's almost a no-brainer, I think, the treatment of non-human animals. So eating meat, that kind of thing, farming yes. animals yes. and so on. Yeah. Are you a vegetarian? I'm trying to be. I'm, I'm vegetarian at home, <laughs> not, not, not necessarily when I'm out out, with, get out as a guest. Do you feel like you're going to make it to the promised land of vegetarianism? I do, yes. Some I point? do, yes. I, well, what I want is for everybody to, and, and it's moving. That, that's another thing, moving in the right direction too. Yeah. There's, there's a great move at the moment towards vegetarianism, veganism indeed. One of the things that I, I, I don't think, and I don't know whether you've ever written in any great detail about, is the environmental crisis. And that would yeah. strike me as being something which you could contribute a great deal to, because it's essentially a failure of rationality and a failure yes, of truth. Yes, it is, and, and it's very important. And uh, it's true, I haven't written much about it. Um, I just haven't got around to it, really. But, it, but I mean, I can't possibly deny its huge importance. I spend a lot of time writing about the environment. That's my principal beat yes. as a scientist. And I really have developed quite a jaundiced view of humanity as a result of this. But you strike me as being somebody who's actually quite optimistic you know, a genuine belief that you know reason and science will prevail. Mm, am I? <laughs> I'm not sure. But some grounds for thinking, science's track record from the past has been encouraging. So such optimism as I have is cautious. And do you feel that your books have helped in the, in respect of winning that? Culture I can't war? possibly <laughs> tell that. I mean, I'm glad I've written all the books that I have, and and I'm glad they're all in print and all selling well. I get numerous letters from people saying, most gratifying of all, which is remarkably frequent actually, is people who say that they became, they went into science um, because they read one of my books. I find it hugely encouraging, hugely gratifying. And do people say that about atheism to you as well? Yeah, oh yes, they do, yes. I was pleased to see in your new book some evolutionary psychology of religion. As an evolutionary biologist, do you, do you buy this, this idea that you know, human brains are naturally receptive to religious ideas and sort of find them intuitively pleasant? I think that's got to be true, uh, and, um, which of course doesn't mean that they're right to do so. We need some kind of explanation for the fact that religion is such a ubiquitous phenomenon all over the world. I mean, one of the important conclusions of that new science, that new cognitive science of religion, is that humans are sort of deeply, chronically irrational, um, that belief in supernatural entities appears to be kind of etched into the way that our brains work. And Do you accept that conclusion? Well, it, it's not universally true, clearly. Um, there are plenty of highly rational people about. We are susceptible to certain irrationalities and um, it's an interesting, the science of irrationality and, and le learning how to overcome that is, is important but um, a lot of people who are not religious, who are not superstitious um, and who do maintain a, a decent sceptical attitude to all such things. So are there any superstitions that you admit to having? Um, I think that if that if, if if I were locked in a in a, a, a notorious haunted house all night, I might be frightened of, you know, the creaking beams or something. I've never tried it, but uh, but I I I, I think we're, we're all of us possibly susceptible to a certain level of irrationality. Thank you. Thank you.